thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and I'm here to talk to you today about some Baratheon list building strategies. Particularly, we're going to be looking at Renly the Charismatic Heir for this list. So, one thing I want to knock out is that the Baratheon Hero Box 1 and 2 are out in the wild in most places right now. I have them in my hands, at least. And, uh, I don't want to incorporate anything from those boxes into this list build. I don't usually interact with things too much until they actually get released and I can start putting them on the table physically. Uh, I don't do a lot of theory crafting around things that haven't been released yet. I don't try to, you know, get my hit the ground running with those. I just wait until they're out and then I play a bunch of games with them to see what I think about them and I haven't really done that with any of the new hero box stuff so some things might feel like they're really windmill slam into this list or easy replacements but for me I'm kind of leaving those out right now and that includes things like the Rose Knights. Uh, I just, they're, they're a good unit, but again, I, I look at things that get spoiled and I say, oh, that's cool, I can't wait to get that in my hand so I can start building with it and putting it to the test on the table. So we're going to be looking at just things that are currently out, uh, out other than the, the Baratheon Hero Box. So anything pre-Baratheon Hero Boxes is what we're going to be working with on this one. So the first place I like to look when it comes to uh, building lists is the commander and I want to try and synergize with what they're bringing to the army as much as I can there we already know that the Baratheon deck has a lot of synergies with things that like to attack a bunch of times or can get value out of attacking a bunch of times so we're already going to have things in here that work with those cards but we're going to try and tilt the focus a little bit towards Renly and what he's trying to bring so when we look at Renly's attachment he is an on-field commander and he brings Boldness and Courage, which gives you a little bit more uh, combat sustain with a unit. If you have full ranks, you end up attacking with plus two additional dice. If, you have, if you're missing a rank, or missing any ranks, you always count as having one additional rank whenever you make attacks. So if you're whittling the unit down that Renly's in, they're still going to be quite dangerous in melee because they've got that extra benefit of having their full rank plus... Uh, for a couple uh, couple extra runs through their unit. So the next ability that he brings is Embolden. And we've seen this on the Tully Cavaliers before. And this kind of puts Renly also in a midfield support role. So he likes to fight and he likes to be kind of clumped around guys so he can give that Embolden bubble off to other people. The Brathian morale isn't terrible, but it's not great either. So having everyone get as many opportunities as they can to take advantage of Embolden is going to make sure that they stay around a lot longer. So we're seeing a little bit of an attrition element in Renly, both in the uh, additional attack value and making sure things stay around a bit longer. So when the uh, Baratheon starter box first came out in the, the in, at Gen Con is when it pre-released, uh, I was putting Renly in... A unit of sentinels because it just made sense it seemed like putting boldness and courage in a unit with sundering and a bunch of dice that hits on threes was a great idea but they have a four plus save so they really weren't sustaining well in combat and they have a seven plus morale and can't take advantage of the emboldened because that affects units that are around you not specifically yourself i believe it says all other units within short range, so Renly can't give that bonus to his unit themselves. So I found, in, and this was of course in the pre-panic change, so things were a little different with 7 plus morale. Uh, you could end up losing a lot of un a lot of bodies uh, in, within one blow of Vicious or a Crown Zap or something like that. So I kind of learned, or I was more so conditioned, to try and get Renly into a unit that was a little bit more defensive. And when I look at uh, the Baratheon Wardens, it's not the unit that you think you would want him, him in right away, because they hit on fours, they don't have the most uh, amazing attack stat in the universe, and they're slow. But the thing we do get is a great 3 plus save for that additional sustain. We have a 6 plus morale, which is just uh, under the hump of awesome. So I feel like the midpoint is somewhere in between 7 and 6. And I know 7's like average on the 2d6 or whatever, like the 7-6 range. But 
Seven for morale to me feels not good, but six feels pretty decent. So getting him in that unit helps them survive a little bit longer. And boldness and courage for them actually makes them quite dangerous on the table because they're, instead of swinging at seven, five, three, they're swinging at nine, seven, five. And with their ability uh, target opening, I think that, or, or is it just the Warhammer ability? I can't remember which one it is that puts out condition tokens. But throwing more dice is really good with them because it means that you're more likely to get those failed saves that are going to let you put the weakened token on your opponent. And then you can use it as a defensive thing for when they attack back at you, or you can use it as an offensive thing for when you're going in and trying to use it as a vulnerable token. So I think that the Wardens are one of those like stealth fighty units, and when you put Renly in there, it makes a lot more sense that you turn them into quite an aggressive unit, even if they are just little stumpies running around. So for the same reason I've kind of stated for the Wardens being in the list, I've added two other units of wardens they're really inexpensive they can t take a lot of table space and hold it down for a good long time so i feel like getting those in getting more of those in here is uh is good and i realized before i move on i need to back up a little bit because i didn't talk about renly's commander cards which is the natural next step of of discussion after talking about their uh attachment but let so we'll back up and then we'll come back to those other two units of uh uh wardens so the first card for renly baratheon is wealth and charisma this card is weird for me uh whenever i see a card where you replace the effect of the tactics board it's got a hefty investment on the front end not only are you chunking away uh an NCU activation, like that's their activation to do this if they don't have any other additional abilities to bring along. You're also throwing away a card, and you're sacrificing the ability of the tactic zone if it's something you wanted to do. So these cards have to be pretty valuable in order for me to enjoy playing them or want to play them. Uh, Sudden Charge, I think, is probably the best one out there, if not one of the best cards in the game, and I feel like uh, it's it's hard to really get up to that level of how good sudden charge is. I don't think wealth and charisma quite get that quite gets there, but it is close, especially when you look at the type of strategy we're going to be employing with this list. When you claim a zone on the tactics board, you can choose one of two modes. You can either heal D3 plus one wounds across units in your army, so you get a a pool of the d3 plus one and can heal them where you need to this can help out in trying to get units back up to another rank so they can be a little bit more effective in combat you also have the ability to uh, choose to remove three condition tokens across units in your army so this way you're i would say underwhelming ish combat units don't get hindered more by having some of those uh negative effects on them with uh, combat to, or with the, the condition tokens. I feel like when I play this card, I'm often going for the wounds because it's just the way that I feel the list plays is it likes to heal a bunch. But uh, I've never really found myself in a situation where the, com where the uh, uh, condition tokens are spread out across my army in such a way where I need to get rid of three at a time. It's not a bad mode to have there. It's just that I, I don't use it often. So again, Wealth and Charisma is not quite Sudden Charge or even close to the level of Sudden Charge, but it's not a bad card and it doesn't make it doesn't make me feel terrible when playing it. It's not just you really have to wait for the situation to present itself. So with this one in early game, I tend to discard it more frequently than I tend to keep it or hold on to it for a rainy day. Next up, we've got Younger, Bolder, and Far More Comely. This card triggers when a friendly combat unit makes a morale test, and uh, it gives them plus two to that morale test. But if they happen to be within long range of Renly Baratheon, when they make the test, if they pass, for every one point they pass by, so every everything they exceed over their... Uh... <sighs> over their morale stat... They end up getting to heal one wound back up to four. So if you're sitting with a a warden unit that's in Renly's bubble bubble for the five plus morale, they go down to a three plus morale, 
and if they roll a seven, they're healing four wounds back to that unit. So it's a pretty good card. This is a, a really awesome one to play, and I think every time I've kind of thrown it down on one of my opponents, they've been really not so happy about it because this can take a unit that was going to die or that was more so in a position to leave the table and make it so they come back and stick around even longer because of it. So this is definitely one that I would never get rid of as a Renly player. I just, it's it's too valuable. The last card for him is They Will Make Me King. And this one triggers when Renly's unit activates. You can choose, again, one of two modes. Uh, the first mode is that you can uh, heal two wounds to Renly's unit and then one wound to every friendly unit within uh, long range of him. The other mode is that you do two wounds to every unit engaged with, or every enemy unit engaged with Renly, and then do one wound to every enemy unit within long range of him. This is another one of those cards that kind of puts us more into that uh, both sides of the attrition basket. We can heal if we need to, and then give our units some more sustain. You can easily get five to six wounds back into onto the table with this card. We also have the ability to kind of clear off Renly a little bit. Like if we just came up short on killing a unit and just magically happened to have two wounds left in it, this card can bail him out so we can go off on the offensive again and charge something that didn't think it was going to get charged that turn. With the prevalence of bears, I think this card gets a lot of value because you can your opponent could try and trip you up by just throwing a bear in front of you, and Renly's unit's pretty... Uh, precious to be doing that too with boulder or bull or boldness and courage but with uh they will make me king it means that that bear is just automatically dying and uh renly can just do what he wants to do which is usually something that your opponent doesn't want you to do or else they wouldn't have thrown that bear into you in the first place so renly's cards put us very much into this attrition mode and it's kind of reminiscent of Jon Snow, but not so uh, pointed in one direction. I think Renly is a little bit more versatile than Jon Snow. And uh, definitely the, the units kind of exist more in that attrition zone than what any of the Night's Watch ones do other than maybe veterans. But for five points, that's the, the wardens, which is why we're taking those other two units of them, which we can come back to. But for these other two units that we have, we're, we're not adding Master Wardens to them, which I think some people might look a little, like, weird at me for. But the reason for that is, oftentimes when you make a unit extremely survivable, it de-incentivizes your opponent from doing anything to them. Or if they try to do something to them, they're going to put a lot of effort and focus into that one unit. And that's going to make it harder for you to catch up with the way that we have to kind of heal back and bounce back into the game. Um, so if you have units that are survivable but not indestructible, um, we can kind of make our opponent kind of spread their attacks a little bit more. And that'll affect us less on the attrition level to try and make... Renly's cards more relevant and let us kind of do things at our own pace. In order to make those wardens more scary so that people are incentivized to go after them and not leave one kind of roaming around, we've added a Stormcrow Lieutenant to each unit. So the Stormcrow Lieutenant brings an ability that says while we own the uh, its improved armaments, when we own the coin position on the tactics board, we end up getting plus one attack die and sundering. So now the wardens are throwing eight, six, four, I believe, for their for their attack stat, and they're sundering. So I think that puts them in a pretty dangerous category. They're not something you want to just leave alone, even if they're only hitting on fours. If they happen to get the charge off first, which isn't impossible for them, they are short, but we have a lot of things that can kind of extend our threat and make us do things outside of activation orders that can kind of surprise opponents. So this makes them dangerous and priorities to get rid of and not leave running around the table just to do whatever they want because they've got that sundering ability. And that puts them, like I said, right into that position where they can do some work to people and trigger those panic tests. So they have to tie both of them up instead of letting all of the boat instead of letting one of them run around. 
So with that, we're going to be grabbing a unit of Baratheon Sentinels. And with they don't have an attachment with them because we are kind of getting a little short on points for what I want to do with this list. But the Baratheon Sentinels are going to be treated a lot like Cave Dweller Savages for Free Folk right now. Um, they're kind of a cleanup unit. They're not going to be initially engaging something unless that something is really weak and we don't have to worry about a bunch of retaliation from them. Uh, they also can stick really close to Renly to make sure that they get that uh, emboldened buff for him and if he ends up getting tied up with something that's a little bit above his weight class they can come in and start doing some more work to it so the the sentinels are not something you want to unpack early you just want to keep them back and make sure you apply them in the way they need to they're kind of like your counter strategy unit which makes counter charge really good for them so that's something that you want to pay attention to is setting them up for good counter charges and leading with units that are going to take that charge to allow them to get into where they need to get into. The last combat unit that we're adding into this list is Stormcrow Mercenaries. Now I think their archers are ones that people look at more because they just seem to kind of have a little bit more traction to them in a list that uh, like this that doesn't have a whole lot of shooting presence. And they're five points, so they also kind of take that role of... Um, that would, you would think would belong to the Sentinels or the Wardens, right? Because they're cheap and they stick around for a while. But I do want something else that puts a little bit more damage out there. Um, and I know that when I say that, it sounds weird because they have the exact same attack stat as the uh, Baratheon Wardens. But they don't have a 3 plus save and uh, they have a, a 7 row instead of a 6. But they do bring... Uh, one of one very important ability, which is adaptive, and adaptive has allowed us to keep three NCU's in this list and add brawn to this unit. So we already have the two Stormcrow lieutenants, and now we're adding brawn. So it's really important for us to get the coin zone. But when we do, our Baratheon wardens get really scary, and Bronze unit of Stormcrows goes from a seven five three to a nine seven five unit. And they go up to speed 7, which is huge for them. They're not going to be failing charges that often. And they go from a 7-plus morale to a 5-plus. And if they're around Renly, they go down to a 4-plus. So this unit gets really death ball scary and can clean off wardens that are also having problems chewing through things. So we've kind of got this, this core of wardens that kind of just assert themselves in the middle of the table or wherever they need to for scenario. And then we've got these other two units that are running around kind of on the flanks, cleaning up units that the Wardens are getting chunked into, especially when we start dropping cards like uh, Ours is the Fury or Counter Charge. These cards can help project a lot of force in our unit or in our units, and then the way that the tactics board works out for us, we're going to get a lot of work out of these guys since they can get an extra attack out of the combat zone or the coin zone. So I think these guys are really, they feel really nice in at home in this list, and it's a cheap option that gives us something that can really punch super hard. Now when I talked about going three NCUs, uh, it almost seems like these days, unless you're playing like Free Folk or Starks, you kind of have to make a choice. Do I want four combat units with three NCUs, or do I want five combat units with two NCUs? Well, with this list, since everything's relatively inexpensive, we haven't had to make that sacrifice, and we can add in three NCUs. The first one we're picking up is Alistair Florent, and it's kind of, he's four points, he doesn't do anything other than his like flip-flopping deal. But that's really important for this list. I want to be able to take the coin when I want it. So if my opponent takes it and says, Ha, I'm going to shut you out of your abilities on the Stormcrow Lieutenants and Brawn, and not give you an opportunity to attack with the, uh, with the uh, Stormcrow Mercenaries, I can deny most of that. I mean, I won't get the extra attack out of them, but I get two chances to get that coin zone when I want it, regardless of what my opponent is wanting to do with me, unless they're playing Varus or something. But uh, I think that Alistair really works in, in this list. When you have that many things that rev rely on getting their work, out of having that particular zone that you just can't not put him in here. For points, we needed a three-point NCU, and even though we have access to one in the Hero Box 2, 
we are only sticking with what's out right now. I mean, like, not Hero Box related, but we're adding Shira Errol to this list, and she's not a concession as like, oh, well, she's the three-point NCU and it's just what we have to put in. She has a lot of synergy with those Stormcrow mercenaries because you can take that coin zone early to not, you can remove a coin from, or remove a condition token from someone that needs it gone and then put one on the target that the, the uh, Stormcrow mercenaries want to attack and that turns on Brawn, so you're getting a ton of attacks, you're getting a condition token, and you're getting an extra attack out of that unit that your opponent just wouldn't have seen coming otherwise. I mean, they'll get it after you do it for the first time, but when you blow up out of nowhere with nine attacks, uh, it's it's not something that can be ignored, and now that you've got the coin, it's going to be hard to get rid of that unit. The last NCU that we've grabbed up is Peter Baelish, and you could switch this with Varus if you wanted a little bit more control on the NCU board, but for me, I like to... Or well, it's not so much it's different control because Peter Baelish controls it in a way where you can take something that your opponent wants but not give up something that you want in terms of getting the ability out of it. So normally when I build lists that have Peter Baelish in them, he's typically the first one that gets cut. But right now I'm having a harder time getting rid of him in this list. When we start working in the Hero Box 2 stuff, I think there will be some really difficult decisions that have to be made. But uh, currently I think he's a good, uh, solid piece for this list that really helps uh, work with it. I mean, we can take the coin zone when we don't want anything to do with that coin ability and then do something like uh, take the maneuver to get somebody into a position or take the tactic zone to draw some extra cards. I mean, there's he can do so much, and this list really likes being able to have a lot of that control over what happens on that NCU board or the tactics board. So I don't feel like he's a, a bad pick for this list. I hope that this gives you a good idea of how to start looking at Renly Baratheon as a attritional focused, both through combat, uh, pumping up combat output, and also trying to help your unit sustain. If you have any comments or questions about this list or something that you want to see me tackle in a future video, leave some comments below. And uh, do like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to keep track of what I put out regularly. And if you want to get notified when I put out something, click the bell icon. Uh, and that's usually... It's a, it's pretty good to do if you want to try and get a hold of these right away because sometimes I publish them overnight. So if you're uh, um, an international viewer, uh, it might come out when it's prime time viewing for you. But for me, it'll be I'm asleep and this thing just published to YouTube. Uh, I also kind of have a little bit of a lag when I get them on Facebook for the same reason. In terms of future content for me, I know we're going to be looking at a Stannis focused list probably with the Hero Box 1 in mind. For the next tactics video, I do have a Howland Reed one in the works that someone requested quite some time ago, but I'm just now getting around to it. And we do have a painting video for Renly's green armor that's going to be coming out soon. And uh, that one's long overdue, but I finally sat down and and, and filmed it. Uh, it just might it might be out when this one comes out or just a little bit after. Uh, I, there are some obvious problems with getting in games right now, so I do have Tabletop Simulator downloaded on my laptop, but that's kind of another problem with kind of the frequency or lack of frequency that I've been putting out videos is that my, my uh, PC has officially died, and uh, I have someone looking at it to try and fix it up for me. But I've been mostly working off of my work laptop right now, and that one doesn't have the greatest capabilities when it comes to filming and editing videos and making all these images, and it surely doesn't seem to have quite the power to film and capture everything for a tabletop simulator game. So uh, bear with me while I kind of find my bearings and figure out what I'm going to do for my uh, my. PC needs in the near future, but I will start trying to put out more content like this and just talk about things in general through the YouTube channel. Uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this one, and I look forward to making the next one for you, and hope you look forward to watching it.